Our text today is Isaiah 43, 25 through 44, verse number 8. And you'll see the message right there before you, forgiven and forgotten. This message is uh, especially pertinent to uh, churches that where people are beginning to come back because, you know, when, when you're at home, you're watching the worship service or when Sunday school's canceled and no, there's no senior programs and, and, and you're just, you're there at your leisure uh, on your couch or maybe with, with your family, uh, the opportunities uh, for forgiveness may not be as abundant as they are when we all get back together. We know that. I've been a preacher a long time, and I know in church, people get their feelings hurt. And people hurt feelings, and, and they don't mean to. And sometimes, sometimes the devil gets in people, and they mean to hurt people's feelings. That's just the fact. That's what happens with people. That even happens in the church of God. So forgiveness is important. You got to have it. You got to do it to be the church God wants you to be. And that's what Clear Creek needs. Every church needs it. Clear Creek needs it. We need the forgiveness of God, but we need the forgiveness of one another. So that's what this message is about today. Our text is taken from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the great prophets of God, and his very name, the name Isaiah, means this, the salvation of Jehovah. Isaiah prophesied, he preached to God's people uh, around 700 years before Jesus was born. And Isaiah describes the people to whom he was sent to preach. He describes them like this, a sinful nation, people who are laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not calling you that, okay? But that's what Isaiah was dealing with when he was preaching and when he was preaching to Israel, God's people. Now even those who claim to know the Lord, Isaiah said this and God said this through the lips of Isaiah. Here's the description of the people. God says they, they draw near to God with their mouth and with their lips they do honor him, but they have removed their hearts far from him. Isaiah 29, 13. So during the prophet's lifetime, during Isaiah's lifetime, Isaiah would experience and see and watch God's people experience the chastisement of the Lord because of their sins. God's people would suffer greatly during this punishment and this time of punishment. They would suffer under the hands of at least two empires during Isaiah's day, the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. So God used foreign armies, he used foreign people to bring judgment upon his people who had sinned. But the book of Isaiah is not just about chastisement and judgment. Isaiah is full of forgiveness. Isaiah is bringing hope to God's people. Hope would come. Hope of a time of being brought back and forgiven and blessed. And that's what God wants to do to his people and for his people. In chapter 32 and also in chapter 53 you'll see these words that later on we apply to the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. By his stripes, we are healed. God is a God of healing. He's a God of love and forgiveness. Let's look at our text. Isaiah 43, beginning with verse 25. I, even I am who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance and let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Your first father sinned 
and your mediators have transgressed against me. In verse 38, and therefore I will profane the princes of the sanctuary. I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to the reproaches. And then verse 44, or chapter 44, verse 1. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring, and they will spring up among the grass like willows of the water courses. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and the name himself by, and name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and this his Redeemer and the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show these to them. And do not fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock I know, not one. What a relief to know that there's a remedy for sin. Not just my sin, but your sin and the sin of the world and the remedy is the forgiveness of God. And he's willing to forgive. But you know, God not only forgives our sins, the Bible says, but God is able to forget our sins. To forgive and forget is a God thing. It's a God thing to be willing to forgive and to forget. But that's not the natural response of mankind. Every one of us forgive and forget, don't we? We do. We forgive, but then we forget that we forgave. That's what we do. That's our model of forgive and forget. Let me say that one more time. We forgive, but then in two minutes we forget that we have forgiven. We forget that we have forgiven. And then the abuses... Whatever we have suffered, the hurt, the harm, is right back before us again. Abuse has come sooner or later. Now, if you've never been abused, if you've never been abused, it's coming. I don't think you can live life without suffering abuse from somebody. Whether it be physical or verbal or, you know, all of us have been hurt in some way or another. Let me tell you a story. Fifth grader Jimmy put on a birthday party in his parents' basement. It was his first big party. By big, I mean girls were invited. Boys and girls. Jimmy's mother helped with the invitations and the food and the decoration. And the big day came. And Jimmy and all the invited guests were down in the basement. They were playing games. They're playing their favorite records on the little 45 record player, listening to the music, eating cake, eating goodies, and well into the party came an angry mother with her child in hand. I'll not name his name. I'll call him the boy Anonymous. Anonymous was one of the bullies. He was also a distant cousin to Jimmy. He was not always welcomed by Jimmy and was most definitely not invited to his birthday party. When Anonymous' mother confronted Jimmy's mother, all Jimmy's mother could do was embarrassingly apologize for not inviting her little boy. 
When the confrontation of the mothers was over, both, both mothers left. And all of a sudden, Jimmy was folded over because the fist of Anonymous had entered his stomach. Jimmy was bent over, but he'll never forget the words as the fist was pulled from his stomach. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Who could forget that? I was Jimmy. <laughs> that was my name when I was little, Jimmy. And still is my name, because I'm still little when I go back to Taylorsville. Forgive? Sure. But forget? We can't make ourselves forget things. It's there. It's a memory. But we're called upon to forgive. Well, Anonymous and I later on became friends. I stayed a little far away. As a matter of fact, he even, we invited him to play and be in one of our first rock and roll bands as a singer, and we got along fine. But it's hard to forget hurts like that. It's hard to forget them or impossible to forget them. That's where forgiveness comes in. As I thought about that little experience, I don't even know why it came to mind. I, I jot sermon notes down everywhere, okay? Just everywhere all my life, all my preaching life, I wrote down little notes, things that, you know, that happened maybe, maybe. and then some things just, wow, they just, Get in your mind. You ever notice how older we, when we get older, we, we think back, we can remember more things about our childhood? You know? You can't remember what you had for lunch yesterday, but you can remember what, something that happened 50 years ago? Yeah, amen, I'm getting one back there. You young folks, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. I thought about my cousin and that whack to the stomach. That's not the worst thing he'd ever done to anybody. He did worse, I know he did. But now think about me. I've hurt people too. I've hurt people. You've hurt people. You have. Will they forgive us? Chances are they won't forget it. There are many opportunities for forgiveness. Now, if somebody wants to be a Christian and be like Jesus, the easiest way is just to forgive somebody, and forgiveness is available out there. There's the opportunities every day is the day, chances maybe, to, to forgive somebody and be like our Lord. A dear Christian friend of mine came to me one time, and uh, she wanted to know if she could meet with me privately. And that's normally a bad thing for a preacher. Somebody wants to meet with you privately, at, you know, if something's going on. So, you know, I met with her, I thought, what's going on? And I was just shocked, I mean, to my roots. She said, I've been meaning to talk to you for months about this. And I thought, what's going on? And she went on to tell me and to confess to me that for months she had ill feelings toward me. She was mad at me. I'd been hurt. She'd been hurt. And I said, well, tell me about it because I have no idea what you're talking about. And I didn't. And after we talked for a while and after we prayed, she felt better. Now, I felt worse because I couldn't even believe that I'd, I'd, I'd hurt her. I didn't even know what I'd said, but I did eventually feel better. But we made up, and I thought to myself after that, what if she had never said anything and have harbored those ill feelings toward me? 
or maybe even worse, had let that root of bitterness grow in her heart, like has happened in some, in some cases with church members, and that has happened, let the root of bitterness grow. And when it grows, then, then so often retaliation follows, and not just that one person against you, it's just then they get friends and they team up against, against you or somebody that has hurt them. That friend told me what had happened, and that gave me an opportunity to apologize and to see and to recognize that maybe I'd said the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, there are times when we need to just keep our mouths shut, right? That's been a long time ago. It's another thing I wrote a note about. I don't even remember what it was. But I remember the, the incident. She forgave me. But chances are she didn't forget. I've never forgotten the experience, but she forgave. But all of you get back to church again, and you get in a large group, the opportunities for forgiveness are going to abound because somebody's going to have their feelings hurt. Somebody's going to say the wrong thing. Somebody's going to do the wrong thing or not say anything when you think that they ought to say something. That's church. That's any group. That's people. Why do you think the Lord talks so much about forgiveness? Paul talks about forgiveness. John talks about Every disciple talks about forgiveness. The prophets. Because the opportunities abound. I remember one, one church I went to and, uh, you know, the I'd first gone, uh, just, just gotten there, and this is your study. And that's great, you know. It's one of my first churches. You know, I had a place to keep books. There were enough shelves there to keep my books and, and, and my desk, and, I, and, and had a nice chair and fixed my study up the way I wanted to, and then it was the first deacon's meeting. I had a deacon mad at me because I'd taken down a picture that his family had donated in the church office in the study. I thought it was my study. But he let me know right, right quick that he was offended that I'd taken down his picture. So I apologized. And I made his picture my picture. Okay, good. We have to work together. And when we're offended, we need to tell somebody. In a Christian way, I've been hurt. You've hurt me. To always open the door for forgiveness and reconciliation. If not... We'll keep doing like what we've been doing all these years as Baptist churches. We'll get along fine, and then somebody will have a fight, and then we'll start another church out there somewhere. That church will have a fight, and they'll start another church out there somewhere. We just can't get along, but we need to. We have to forgive. Forgiveness <clears throat> is a gift. It's a gift that's offered to us by the Lord. He shows us how to do it. Gives us the power to do it as a Christian and blesses us when we do it. Forgiveness is a gift. You know, we, we sin against one another. But oh, how we sin against the Lord. The Bible's got some bad news for all of us and we know what it is. All have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin is death. It's just like Joe read. The Bible says that for, for, through one man, death came to the world. It was Adam. But through Jesus, life comes. Life comes. That's the good news. That fist that hit little Jimmy in the stomach, it hurt. <laughs> oh, it hurt. If you don't believe it, let somebody whack you in the stomach sometime. It hurt. Those words that came out of my mouth to my friend that day hurt. It hurt her. But we can't imagine the ways that we hurt God. After all he's done for us and how good he is to us, how we hurt our Lord, we cannot imagine the ultimate hurt 
to our Lord was the torturing and the nailing him to the cross, that perfect son of God who did nothing but can't come to love and show us how to love, show us how to forgive. But we nailed him to the cross. I say we, well, it was our sins that did it. There were human instruments <clears throat> that the Lord used. There was Pilate and the Roman soldiers and the Pharisees and the scribes and those who hated Jesus. They, they were instruments, but it was our sin, it was my sin that nailed him there. That's why he went to the cross. But yet he was willing to forgive if we confess our sins and repent of our sins. One of the disciples of the Lord, John, wrote this. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that ought to make us e eager to pray every day and say, Lord, I've, I've, I've done this. And if I've done this, if I've sinned, like my experience with my dear friend, my church member, I didn't know I'd done it. We can sin and not know we've sinned. Chances are we begin to sin as soon as we lay one foot out of the bed because, you know, what do you think about? Have, have you thought about helping somebody? Do you think about the poor? All kinds of things that we ought to do, but we don't do it. Thus we've sinned. God's forgiveness is marvelous. He chooses to forgive. And then he does not hold that against us. When we look at some of the Bible characters, we say that they really are characters. You know, we... We hold them up for the good things they did, but like us, I mean, some of them committed some terrible crimes, terrible sins, but yet God loved them and God forgave them. I think about Ken, King David who penned these words of Psalm 103. He made known his ways to Moses his acts to the children of Israel, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Slow to anger. What would it be like to, to be in a church where we knew that everybody was slow to anger and they didn't have a chip on their shoulders? But we know that church is a messy place because everybody in church is at a different stage in their spiritual development. Some have known the Lord for a long time and know the scriptures and try to be like Christ. And over the years have become more and more like Jesus. And then they got others that have been to church all their lives. It's like they hadn't learned a thing. Just got a chip on their shoulder, daring you to, to step beyond that circle or to knock that chip off. We need to be slow to anger. Slow to anger. Give people a chance. Look at both sides. Listen to folks. We're not always right. Listen to somebody else. Abounding in mercy. God is abounding in mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Remember that in one of the Beatitudes? And then David says, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Praise the Lord for that. Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the mercy of God toward those who fear Him. That means those who reverence Him, who love Him and respect Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. The east to the west, that's a long way. It doesn't stop. It just keeps going. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And then the prophet Micah has this to say in Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again and he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou hast cast their sins into the depths of the sea. 
and thou wilt perform the truth of Jacob and to the mercy of Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Well, we began with the text of Isaiah, and I want to read it one more time. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins anymore. Those words were written hundreds of years before Jesus came and said the same thing. And then after Jesus, John wrote this, and God showed it to him in Revelation 21. I want to read it to you, and I want you to see how it relates to what Isaiah says here. Revelation 21, 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Did I not read that from Isaiah? The beginning and the end. Like always, Jesus did his part. And through confession of our sins and repentance, we can be forgiven by him and our sins not held against us. Paul writes this in Ephesians 4.32, church. Clear Creek Baptist Church, those who are right here, for me, and those who are watching and listening. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You can forgive. And if you're a Christian, you must forgive. The forgetting part is a little different. And I think that's why forgiveness is such a miracle. It's because even though somebody's hurt you, you remember the hurt, you might feel the hurt, the hurt might be with you always. The memory of the hurt yet you're willing to open your lives up and to be hurt again if needs be. You're willing to give people not just one more chance. What would life be like if we only got one chance from people? It'd be awful, wouldn't it? But a chance after a chance after a chance. Our not forgetting makes forgiveness that much more precious and powerful. Forgiveness is an act of godliness. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. And forgiveness is the standard action and lifestyle of somebody who says that they're a Christian. My job is to get you ready for your next pastor when the church is filling up. And I believe you will be a church slow to anger, a church willing to forgive, people willing to give somebody an extra chance. I do believe that because I know that you believe what God says and you love the Lord. Well, when I talk about forgiveness... That's a God thing. That's a powerful thing. The Holy Spirit of the Lord will do that for you and give you the opportunity to do that. But if you're not a Christian, let me tell you, God's Spirit does not reside in you if you're not a Christian. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not controlled by the Spirit. The Bible says you're still carnal. You need the power of God. So today would you not only accept salvation, but accept all that Holy Spirit, all God's Holy Spirit would want to give you as you repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today. And maybe, I, I don't know your heart, maybe that uh, as you think about people coming back to church, you may have already had this thought. So-and-so is going to be back when everybody